Welcome to UO Today. I'm Barbara Altman, sitting in for Steve Shankman, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. Our guest today is Arturo Arias, a visiting professor from the University of Texas, Austin. Arturo Arias is giving a series of four lectures while he is here as part of a two-year program on human rights and truth commissions in Latin America. His visit is sponsored by Latin American Studies, Romance Languages, and the Savage Endowment for International Relations and Peace. Arturo Arias earned his BA and MA at Boston University and his PhD in Sociology of Literature at L'Ecole des Hautes Etudes in Paris, France. Arturo Arias is a novelist and screenwriter as well as an academic. His novel, After the Bombs, was published in both English and Spanish in 1979. His most recent novel in English is Rattlesnake, published in 2003. He has written six other novels in Spanish. He is also the co-writer of the 1984 film El Norte. His academic books include Taking Their Word, Literature and the Signs of Central America, published in 2007, and The Rigoberta Menchu Controversy, published in 2000. Welcome to the program. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. We're very pleased to have you here, to have you working with our students, and to have you working in our intellectual community. Um, I wonder if you could start by telling us a little bit about your trajectory. You were born in Guatemala. You went to college in Boston and right. then did your graduate work in Paris. What, how did you determine the path of that journey? Well, uh, part of it determined itself, and part of it was my own will and volition. Mm -hmm. uh, life in Guatemala in the 1960s was tough. Uh, the beginning of the Civil War had already created an ambience of terror and fear, bomb explosions, n nothing too different from what perhaps you might see in Iraq right now. And so growing up and going to high school under those conditions was extremely hard. So I was doing the best I could to get out of the country and was lucky enough to get the tail end of the benefits of the Alliance for Progress. I got a scholarship to go to Boston University and clung to it for dear life and spent the next uh, six years in Boston working on both my BA and MA. And then I, ha I already had, I had been writing since I was a child, but it was while at Boston that I decided that I wanted to write novels and publish them. And so it was a funny combination of both my creative and my critical side that took me to Paris. Creatively, there was that romantic myth that to be a writer, you have to go and sit in the cafes of Paris and wait for inspiration to come and meet all the other famous writers. And academically, I had been taken by French critical theory and wanted to be exposed to more of it. So both those factors uh, made me go to Paris in the 70s. And uh, I did meet some writers, primarily Latin American writers who were living in Paris, and did write my first novel there after the bombs. And I ended up getting my PhD and uh, taking courses with well-known French critics like Roland Barthes. So it was, uh, it was very much uh, a very enriching decade. So that explains how that happened. <laughs> you work multilingually, obviously. Yes. Which is the topic perhaps we can get back to when Although we Although we should about never talk about the quality of my French, my written <laughs> French when it came to writing a dissertation. <laughs> I understand, but you certainly publish fiction as well as criticism in both Spanish and English, yes, correct? Yes, yes, correct. But not in French, you're saying? No. <laughs> the only thing I ever wrote in French was my dissertation. <laughs> I understand. It was one of those academic exercises. Yes. With all of that, um, that wandering, though, that you, were, you and many of your contemporaries were forced to undertake, you decided to stay with the study of Spanish-American literature. Yes. Can you explain that? Well, it was my native language, Spanish. I came from Guatemala. In 1967, Miguel Ángel Asturias, who's Guatemala's best-known writer in the 20th century, won the Nobel Prize for Literature. So I was, you know, then 16. I thought, okay, you know, I gotta follow his footsteps and do likewise. And uh, to do it, I had to plunge into uh, everything I possibly could as far as knowing uh, literature written in Spanish and feeling that I could master 
the novel in Spanish, and so that explains a great deal of that trajectory. But of course, soon along in that path, it became also uh, an issue of conscience and politics, you know, feeling that we were all struggling to make Latin America visible, to make its imprint in the world, that literature was a good part of it, major writers like Garcia Marquez, Vargas Llosa, and others were being translated and, and helping to explain what Latin America was about to the rest of the world. And so it became clear to me that it was not just uh, an artistic vocation, but a broader issue that I had to embrace and I was most happy to do so. So as well as studying Spanish-American literature, literature written in Spanish, you also work on indigenous literatures and specifically the many different forms of Mayan literature. Well, that, that was a gradual process too uh -huh. because though I was raised in Guatemala City in an urban, metropolitan, Spanish-speaking, western center environment, Guatemala is a country whose ma majority are indigenous peoples, Mayas. And so that fact you cannot avoid it unless you close your eyes. It's, it's a reality of life. It's like, you know, if you grew up in the south of the U.S. in the 19th century, don't realize there was an African-American population there. So um, Asturias, I mentioned him before, who won the Nobel Prize in 67, had written about Mayas. His best-known novel is called Men of Mays, and it's a contemporary recreation of Maya peoples. And so I was very conscious that... Uh, if I was to write about my country and my people, I would have to plunge into uh, Maya culture as well. So while in Paris, I began to gradually get my toes wet, and little by little, it became a fascination, an attraction, a full embrace, and ultimately, well, I cannot become a Maya, but uh, you know, I feel perhaps even more at home among Mayas than among non-Mayas when I'm in my own country. That involves mastering or at least uh, comprehending a number of different dialects, isn't that right? In theory. In practice, I only comprehend one, which is Quiche. Uh -huh. Quiche is the dominant language, the dominant Maya language, the one spoken by the majority of Mayas, but there are 23 languages in what am I, languages with various dialects okay. in each of those languages in Guatemala alone and four more Maya languages in Mexico. So it's simply impossible to know all of them. That is a daunting prospect. Uh, yes, I understand. absolutely. In one of your articles, I pulled out the sentence that the Maya are the most representative ethnic group of the Central American region. Mm -hmm. Could you explain that? Yes. Uh, the Maya have been present in the area for the last 2,500 years. Um, we can trace most cultural patterns that we associate with indigenous presence in, the, in Middle America to Maya evolution from the so-called Maya calendar, which exists at least uh, since 2,000 years ago and which was more precise at the time of the Spanish conquest than the European calendar. Uh, their knowledge of astronomy and of mathematics, it was the only other culture in the world that invented a zero and was able as a result to do enormous mathematical calculations which made them incredible astronomers despite the lack of uh, technology, telescopes and the like to be able to study the sky. Um, the cultivation of maize or corn, which was the not only the basic food staple of the region, but it was a sacred product. The belief is that uh, human beings were made of maize, that uh, the found founding gods mixed uh, the, the uh, syrup of both yellow and white corn, poured it into the fire, and out of there, came the first four men and the first four women, which were created together, not women from the rib of men. And um, so corn is sacred. It is the staple food, the basis for tortillas, which is also a, a product of Maya culture. And uh, so Mayas not only have uh, survived into the present, 
But uh, if we can draw a metaphor from European history, they were perceived in the ancient world much like Greeks were in the European world. Most knowledge, most art, most technological advances of pre-Hispanic times came from the Maya, and from the Maya they spread into other cultures of the Western Hemisphere. And since there was a lot of trade, uh, not the Mediterranean, but the Caribbean, and up and down the Pacific coast, Maya objects traveled as far north that we know of as Northern California, and as far south as Chile. Uh, and so all of that made the Mayas absolutely the key cultural component for the evolution of indigenous cultures in the Americas prior to the arrival of the Spaniards. So it makes them an, a particularly important people for the study of both pre-colonial and post-colonial times. Exactly, exactly. I understand. Mayan literature, as in works of literature written in one of the Maya languages, is a relatively recent phenomenon. Is that correct? That is correct in contemporary terms. But the Maya wrote and had many libraries. Um, their writing was in the style of codexes, uh, kind of long strips of wood bark in which they would paint. Uh, and there was a combination of uh, uh, what, what's commonly called glyphs is really a combination of pictographic signs and some phonemes. And, but that was not known, needless to say, in the, in the 16th century. So the uh, Spanish priests that came with the conquistadors thought that these were works of the devil and burned them. And so from pre-Hispanic times, we only have approximately uh, three documents left in full, co totally from start to finish, and fragments of some others that survive. And just those that survive give us an idea of how complex was Maya writing, mathematical calculations, and the writing of their own history, which is really not unlike how Europeans were drawn history from the perspective of rulers. Every ruler made sure that the scribe said that he was the greatest ruler of all time, and that he had won many battles and had many wives, and <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but in similar also to Europe at the time, uh, it was only the Maya elite that knew how to read these documents. The population at large were illiterate, and usually what would happen is that in the ritual uh, days, in holidays, uh, they would perform a lot of the major books, especially the religious books, perform them for the audience, almost like a theatrical representation. And so a lot of them uh, that survive have like little cues that indicate, you know, now you're supposed to toast to the audience and things of that sort because they were written so that they would be performed for an illiterate audience that would then learn religion, tradition, customs, the heroic stories of their ancestors through this perfor uh, performativity process. But uh, of course, since the elite were primarily the victims of the conquest, most of them were killed, that transformed very quickly the surviving population into an illiterate people. And the myth that indigenous peoples, especially Mayas, uh, were, uh, was, uh, became almost a cliche, which had not been the case at the time of the conquest. For the record, six-sevenths of the Maya population estimated at approximately uh, 10 million people in the area at the time of the conquest were killed uh, during this process in the 16th century. And Mayas never again had the same number population-wise that they had had in 1520 until 1950. That gives you an idea. So anyway, uh, once conquest had happened, the Spaniards forbade indigenous peoples to learn to read and write as part of the process of domination and population control. Um, they could only uh, communicate to the Spanish authorities through the mediation of the local priests. And so um, they never learned Spanish and they never learned to re read and write, but again, not because of any uh, intrinsic inability, but because 
the nature of coloniality was such that prevented them from doing so. Then independence from Spain happened in the early 19th century, but by then the myth of the superiority of white people over indigenous peoples had become almost a given. The 19th century, as we all know, was uh, a colonial imperial racist century throughout the world. And so the legacy of that really lasted in most of Latin America as in really a good part of the so-called third world until the end of World War II. And so it was only in the 1950s that programs to educate Mayas began to actually kick in, uh, led at first by religious orders and then in the 1960s by international agencies. And so it was only until the 1970s that we began to have contemporary Mayas who would not only finish high school, but would go to university, get a profession, and think of writing a book, and begin to write in a book. Then there was the issue of language. They had learned their own language in their village, but it had become an oral language. There was no written tradition. They had to be educated in Spanish, went to school in Spanish, and so part of what they had to do and began to do in the course of the 1970s was to recreate their own written language. They began to standardize written Maya languages. This was a joint process of both the first generation of Mayas who had uh, college degrees working with linguists from different places in the world who usually came through international agencies and began working with them to begin to systematize their language in writing and to standardize these writings. Now, all 23 languages have been standardized. There's an Academy of Maya Languages and there's a dictionary of every single one of the Maya languages. But this began from scratch in 1970 when the Francisco Marroquin Foundation was created, that was the name of it, which was created well, with help from various international agencies. And Quiche, the, the best known of the languages, the one I know, began to be systematized first. So um, the first writers, the first one I taught actually here, like Luis de Leon, who's a Cachiquel Maya, who wrote in the early 70s, he wrote in Spanish. And it's only until the 1980s that people begin to actually write in their own language. And we begin to see the first publications in Maya languages. And of course, since only their own community could read them, they made a point of translating it themselves to Spanish. So they're all bilingual books. That's a very interesting and complex question for the, the notion of post-colonial studies, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely, yes. Do you want to touch on that one a little bit, what, you, what those bilingual editions represent? Well, uh, part of what they do certainly is uh, make evident how the natural language of a good part of the Americas was not Spanish, but Spanish was an imperial imposition that now against which most indigenous people have to struggle in order to reaffirm themselves, reaffirm their culture, and to bring forth what their own cultural heritage is all about. And so they have to other Spanish as an imperial imposition, as a colonial disquisition, and make those who think that Spanish is intrinsic or natural to the Latin American world realize the colonial angle of the language and begin to value the reemergence of indigenous languages and the right of indigenous peoples to learn their own language, be educated in their own language, practice uh, their own local political structures in their own language in collusion with but not exclusively from Spanish. I understand that part of the argument for, um, or one of the important facets of looking at what one might see um, as the success of Maya culture in the last decades is that it has implications for the whole corridor, I believe you call it, the corridor of indigenous peoples yes. from one end of the Americas to the other. Mm -hmm. So the, the political significance of, of the gains that Maya culture has made in the last decades is something that resonates far beyond Guatemala itself. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you begin to see now um, 
a pan-indigenous movement throughout the Americas. Uh, they're all in constant contact with each other. Native Americans too, but I would say that they're more in touch with Canadian uh, indigenous peoples. Um, for example, the Maya University is being modeled on the indigenous university in Saskatchewan. And so there are a lot of links that way, but they go all the way down south. Um, right now f in Bolivia, well actually a couple of years ago, we had the first indigenous president elected in Bolivia, Evo Morales. There's a very strong indigenous movement as far down south as Chile. And we see those repercussions not just throughout the Americas, but the indigenous voice begins to have an impact at a global scale. Could I ask you to talk a little bit about your own dual writing career? You're a writer of fiction, you're a writer of academic work, of, um, of literary criticism, of cultural criticism. I believe you say that ethnic issues and subaltern identity are central to both your fiction and your academic writing. Could you explain a little bit how it informs your fiction? Yeah, if we understand that Guatemala is 60% Maya, and that Mayas have been subalternized by the colonial experience for at least 500 years, and they're only now beginning to emerge, and that Mayas, as all indigenous peoples, represent an ethnic identity because that's what defines them in opposition to uh, that population which is descendant of of European nations, but primarily, needless to say, of Spain, given the place we're talking about, then you cannot avoid dealing with the implications of ethnicity and subalternism when trying to convey the reality of Guatemala. Um, my writing is very much rooted in Guatemala. That doesn't mean that, it, there no, that, that scenarios outside of Guatemala don't appear in novels of mine uh, some, some scenes have taken place in Mexico, in Brazil, in California, but what anchors them is those Guatemalan characters who might be at play in the world, but remain always Guatemalan and thus have to deal with thus that dual identity. They're always, in the best case scenario, half Maya, in some cases fully Maya, and th thus subalternized. And those are issues that they have to deal with in the world. It's something that you see. For example, in the Los Angeles area, uh, you have at least, that we know of, uh, close to 50,000 Mayas. Uh, here, they're part of the quote-unquote Latino community. They're not Latino. They're Maya. And their first language is, well, depending which group they are, Canjobal or Cachiquel or Quechí. They interact with each other as Mayas. They interact with other Guatemalan immigrants, and needless to say, they also interact with other Latino immigrants, primarily Mexicans, not to speak of the non-Latino Angelino world. Uh, and so they always have to deal with it. They always have those issues with them. Um, prior to moving to Texas, I lived in California for a long time, so I'm especially familiar with the Angelino experience, and there it, it hits you in the face when you are interacting with quote-unquote Latino communities who happen to be Maya, say Canjobal, who have all their traditional celebrations. I remember the first time I went to the Feast of San Miguel in September. That was, oh, 92, I think. Uh, they held it in a huge indoor auditorium in southeast LA. And when you walked in, it was like if you had walked through a time warp. Inside, it was like if you were in the town of San Miguel, high in the Sierra Madre in Guatemala, and everybody looked just like the people of San Miguel, with a f few exceptions. There were a few Asians here, a few African Americans there, a few Anglos there, and you realize, okay, we're still in the U.S. But otherwise, it was exactly as if you had just walked into San Miguel. Uh, and so they, they struggled to keep their identity but that also implies a split identity. And, and so as a writer, and I visualize the role of a writer as someone who bears witness about the travails of their people, you have to account for those issues. In one of your articles, it's um, entitled uh, Personal Stories of Latin Americanism, 
mm -hmm. recently published 2004 in the Radical History Review, the first sentence is, quote, to be a Central American author is an oxymoron, mm -hmm. unquote. And you, f you expand upon that by saying that a Central American author is a marginality within the marginality. Mm -hmm. 2004, four years ago, is that marginal aspect changing? Well, not in the sense that I wanted to convey in, in that article. Because when mainstream America, mainstream Europe thinks of Latin America, they tend to think of the bigger countries, Mexico, Brazil, in Europe, Argentina has more of a presence than in the U.S. Um, they are the larger, more powerful, wealthier countries that exercise power also within the Latin American landscape so that the smaller countries like Central America remain on the margins not only of the U.S. or Europe, but on the margins of Mexico, of Brazil, of Argentina, uh, often depending on their own ec economies. Um, if you try to cross the border, not me, but if a Maya who wants to migrate to the U.S. wants to cross the border from Guatemala to Mexico, he or she will encounter the same difficulties and obstacles from the Mexican authorities at, uh, at the border than a Mexican might encounter crossing the border into the U.S. So that creates a double sense of marginality. You're not even Mexican. You're lesser than Mexican. And so that creates that, that double bind that I'm trying to address. And that becomes true when you are writing or trying to convey that experience because power plays according to how visible a place in the world is. So Mexico is much more visible. Brazil is much more visible. A Brazilian writer, a Mexican writer, simply by virtue of being Mexican or Brazilian, already are known quantities in, if they travel to Spain, to France, to the U.S. A Guatemalan writer always begs the question, in what's that country? Where is it? <laughs> we may need to close on that question. <laughs> we might have to close on that question. <laughs> Thank you so much for your explanations, and we're very pleased to have you oh, with I'm us. I'm very for a happy month. to be here. Thank you for your questions. They were wonderful. I've enjoyed speaking with you. We've been talking with vis visiting Professor Arturo Arias, who is a professor in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at the University of Texas at Austin. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you.